Good evening. Well, as I think most people know, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 has now hit Jupiter. And since the comet no longer exists, this seems rather a good time to take stock and say just what it's told us. You can see Jupiter in the evening sky now. This is a sketch I made a little while ago with my own telescope. Jupiter's a big world, over 89,000 miles across and something like 500 million miles away. Not like the Earth, the surface is gaseous with cloud belts and various features such as the great red spot. Inside, Jupiter is quite different from the Earth. There's a silicate core surrounded by layers of liquid hydrogen and outside that, the deep gaseous atmosphere we can actually see. Now, the comet impacts, unfortunately, occurred on the side of Jupiter turned away from the Earth. But luckily, Jupiter is a very quick spinner, as you can see from this speeded up picture. It turns around in less than 10 hours. And that arrow indicates the latitude where the comet impacts actually struck. Uh, so, because of Jupiter's quick spin, the affected areas were brought down into our view only a few minutes later. Now, a comet had been described as a dirty snowball, and it's a very low mass. Even a large comet, such as Halley's, has a nucleus less than 20 miles across. And the nucleus is the only semi-solid part of the comet. It can be surrounded by a coma, and very often get a tail or tails. Well, Halley's comet comes back every 76 years. Now, the last return, the nucleus was imaged by the space probe Giotto, and there's that famous picture showing the, the dark nucleus with bright areas where material is gushing out. But then, in 1992, the well-known American comet hunters, uh, Eugene and Carolyn Shoemaker and David Levy, discovered something very strange. They described it as a squashed comet. And here is a later photograph taken by David Jewett. And you can see it's very unusual indeed. Something strange has happened to it. And at this stage, I'm delighted to welcome back to the sky at night one of our regular guests, who's also a comet expert, Dr. John Mason. John, it was a very strange comet, wasn't it? It was indeed. This was one of only th three comets ever to have been found, not orbiting the Sun, but actually orbiting the planet Jupiter. It goes around Jupiter in a very long, narrow path that took it out to some 50 million kilometres from the planet in July of 1993. And we think it's been looping around Jupiter since at least 1970. In July 1992, it passed just 21,000 kilometres above Jupiter's cloud tops, where it was torn apart by Jupiter's gravity, and this process caused the release of dust and gas, which brightened up the fragments sufficiently to permit their discovery in March of 1993. Now, the other interesting thing is not only has it been torn apart by Jupiter, but it was actually discovered as observations come in that it would actually collide with the planet Jupiter in July of 1994. And although we've always thought that comets could collide with planets and have happened many, many times, this is the first time we'd actually see it happen. And, of course, no one got any idea what was going to happen. I mean, certainly I didn't. Indeed not. And the, some of the greatest uncertainties, we didn't know the sizes, all the masses, all the makeup of the fragments. It all depended on when the comet actually was broken up. Uh, depending on this, it could have either been eight kilometres across at largest or only two kilometres across at smallest. And this would have meant that after fragmentation, the fragments might have been largest one or two kilometres, or they might have been much smaller, only a few hundred metres. And, of course, there was the strength of the fragments. Was it made of material more like solid ice? And was it, therefore, fairly hard? Or was it very brittle and would break up easily? Now, the line of fragments was lettered from A through to W. The first one due to impact fragment A on July the 16th, the last one W on July 22nd. And you can see in this picture that they are of different brightnesses with their tails stretching out. And the different brightnesses was taken to indicate a variation of size of fragment along the line. As time went on and more pictures were taken, it became clear that many of these fragments were brittle. Fragments P and Q, for example, both split into two, and as this later picture shows, P2 subsequently split again, and P1 faded out altogether. So they were dealing with material that was very brittle, and indeed some people thought that these comets, more than being solid fragments, might be just piles of icy rubble. So there were a lot of uncertainties. As the fragments come in towards Jupiter, they're accelerated by Jupiter's gravity, and by the time they actually get to the cloud tops, the line of fragments would be travelling at 60 kilometres per second. That's 135,000 miles an hour. But because there was so much uncertainty in the masses of the fragments, we didn't really know exactly what would happen. As the icy fragments uh, impacted the cloud tops of Jupiter, it all depended on how solid they were, how big a bang we would get. 
For example, if we had a solid lump of ice, perhaps two kilometres across, uh, exploding in Jupiter's clouds, you might get a release of a million megatons of TNT. Isn't it a pity that the impacts occurred on the side of Jupiter turned away from the Earth? It's a great pity, but even so, it was very exciting. Now, of course, the 20 fragments or so slowly spread apart as time went on. And as you can see in this sequence with for photographs, the fragments have changed in brightnesses, some of them have faded, some have split, and they've slowly spread apart. And the uh, collisions were due to take place over a five and a half day period between July the 16th and July the 22nd. Now this video animation shows the whole sequence of impacts. You can see there they are, fragment A, the first one, on July the 16th. And on this animation, the impacts are yellow first time round and blue on subsequent rotations of the planet. Those are false colours, of course. As the days went on, more and more impacts occurred. There was a clustering of some of the impacts. Eight occurred within just 43 degrees of longitude. But all in all, the impacts occurred around the 45 degrees south latitude. Now, there was great interest in trying to understand how deep would the fragments penetrate into Jupiter's cloud deck. This again depended on how solid and how large the fragments were. In this computer simulation from Kevin Zanley of NASA Ames, you can see a simulated large fragment coming into Jupiter's clouds. Now, the outer stratosphere consists of methane clouds. Then at about the one bar level, there's a layer of ammonia clouds. That's the darker blue line on this picture. And you can see that this fragment has penetrated below that, down to the three bar level, where you have the ammonium hydrosulfide clouds. So there were a lot of uncertainties. It was all very exciting. And it was all very exciting indeed. And of course, observatories all over the world were on watch. When the comet was discovered, Dr. Jim Scotty was uh, in Arizona using the Space Watch telescope at Kitt Peak. Yes, David Levy called me uh, the evening of the discovery on March 26th, uh, Universal Time. And uh, he asked me if I would be able to recover a comet. And being a comet observer, I was very keen to go out and observe uh, a new comet. Uh, we were a little skeptical at first that it was real. But when I uh, finally got the image, uh, I was amazed by uh, a sight that looked like uh, this image here, where you can see the nuclear train in the middle, the bright uh, streak. Uh, you can even see the individual nuclei, perhaps, in that frame. And you can see tails coming off the individual nuclei and the uh, dust wings going out to the east and the west on both sides. When we magnify the image and look a little bit more closely, you can see the individual nuclei spread out. This is an image taken uh, two nights after the discovery at the Stewart Observatory 90 inch, uh, right next door to our telescope. And uh, when I approached uh, Jay Malosh, who is a colleague at the Lunar and Planetary Lab, uh, regarding uh, what might have caused this kind of a, a thing to appear, uh, he immediately was uh, uh, mentioned that uh, He'd seen something very much like that just, just a, a few days, uh, he was just thinking of, a, of this thing a few days before. And uh, he went through his files and picked out an image uh, of a crater chain on the um, Galilean moon uh, Callisto. And this is pretty much what he saw, this thing that looks very, very much like uh, Shoemaker Levy 9. So we were very excited about it and he went off to think about uh, what uh, might have caused uh, crater chains on Callisto and Shoemaker-Levy 9, and we came up at that point with the tidal breakup model, where we assume that the object breaks up very close to the, the uh, point of perigeov, and from that we can determine exactly how big the thing is and how the nuclei will fly off later. Uh, this image uh, uh, shown here is, was taken in February of this year, so very much later than the earlier images. And you can see that the uh, dust trails, the wings, have almost vanished. They're just barely detectable. And the tails coming off the individual nuclei are very much uh, more prominent as the, uh, the piece is spread out. And we watched that happen as uh, they uh, approached the impact time. We were very excited about that. Did your predictions turn out to be fairly accurate? They worked fairly well, considering how early we made them. They predicted the uh, separation of the, of the string of nuclei and uh, and pretty much where all the, the dust would be going as well. And what about your observations made later at the WISE Observatory in, in Israel? During the impact week, I traveled to the WISE Observatory, and uh, my first goal was to try to uh, observe the individual nuclei as they approached the planet. That turned out to be very, very much more difficult than I had planned. Uh, the moon was right next to Jupiter at the time, and Jupiter, of course, was right next to the comets. So we had a, a great deal of difficulty, but we got one, at least one successful image. Uh, and we realized that we weren't going to do much better, so we switched to uh, imaging mode of the planet, where we took multiple color images 
uh, in rapid fire uh, to to look for changes in the in the planet uh, as time goes on. Especially after we heard about the exciting plumes and fireballs and all the other things that were going on at the other observatories. So uh, this uh, uh, image here shows a uh, red filtered image where uh, the red spot is a very light shade uh, near the edge of the planet and the big dark spot near the bottom of the planet there is uh, one of the impact sites. Uh, the impact sites showed up very much better in uh, the bluer wavelengths. This is an ultraviolet filtered image and the, the impact sites show up very, very much better as much darker spots and the red spot shows up as a dark feature there as well. Of course, the comet was studied in all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, and particularly, I think, in infrared, because the infrared results were detectable long after the actual impacts had taken place. Well, Dr. Steve Miller was on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii using the infrared telescopes there, and he's flown over specially to be with us, so we're delighted to see you, Steve. What Thank results you, did you get? Well, I think we got some really very exciting results. Uh, for example, the NASA infrared telescope was working flat out when impact C occurred, when fragment C occurred. And we were able to get a very, very good image of this. And what you can see in this video, here's the impact site of the first fragment, fragment A, just coming over. It's a day old, it's a Jupiter day old. And as the planet rotates, then what you can see is this huge flare coming up from fragment C, this very, very bright plume coming over the horizon, and then you can see it die down again. And what we're watching now is the two spots, fragment A leading fragment C around the planet. So that was very exciting, told us quite a lot about the sort of the temperature and what was going on with this impact. You can get a great deal of science out of that. Yes, we can. And one of the things that we were able to do that was very useful was to look at Jupiter in a whole range of wavelengths in the infrared. Now when we do that, what we're trying to do is to use wavelength as a way of sensing different depths in the planet. So for example, if you take this series of images that we have here, starting in the top left, we're looking right down to the three bar, the three Earth atmosphere level, where you have these clouds of ammonium, hydrogen, sulfide. And what you can see there, we're looking for fragments A and fragment C. You can't see very much there. If you look at the next image, we're coming up to about the one bar level where the clouds are made of ammonia. You can just about pick up fragment A. And then as you move along that sequence in the top row, so fragment A is getting brighter, and then you can see fragment C as you're going up and up in the atmosphere. If we go to the bottom row, then the bottom left image is right at the very top of Jupiter's atmosphere, the ionosphere. Now, all you see there is fragment C. Fragment C is fresh, its material is still high up in the atmosphere, whereas fragment A, the material is already settling down because it's a day old. And then as we go along that sequence, so what we're looking at is going back down deeper into the planet. And we can see the relative brightnesses of the fragment A and fragment C impacts, and therefore we can know something about the height. You can tell also a great deal about the actual materials, can't you? Yes, we can. This is where spectroscopy comes in. Now, we were doing that with the United Kingdom telescope, UCAT, also on Mauna Kea. And what I have here are a sequence of spectra. Now, what I've, I've got this first one here. This shows very, very key fingerprint lines in Jupiter's ionosphere, the top layer of Jupiter. We have to give up one dimension of spatial resolution in this, and all we have is a cut from east to west across the planet. And you can see here that in this uh, spectrum that in the east we're fairly dark, but we brighten up as we go to the west. And that's the normal ionosphere of Jupiter. Now, when fragment B came in, fragment B was really a drizzle but it did affect the upper atmosphere. And so what you see is that the brightness flips over, and now it's the east where the impact is occurring that is bright as against the west, which is much darker. And then we have a look at fragment C, which was really quite a bang, as you could see from that video. And look, it's completely wiped out. Here are the lines of the ionosphere, but it's completely wiped out our spectrum where the impact has occurred. And if we take a cut across the centre of the planet, and a cut across here where the impacts occurred, you can see the difference. Here's the cut across the centre of the planet. Here are these four lines. This very strong one. Note this very strong one. When we come to the fragment C impact, then this very strong line from the normal planet is right down here, completely dwarfed. 50 times stronger are these other lines that come from methane, and they show that the planet was really heating up very much and that we ought to be able to, it'll take us a while, but we ought to be able to, to model the way the temperature of this fireball due to fragment C changed over time. So that's very exciting and this is where spectroscopy can really tie down the changes that we're seeing in the images. What about the ripple effect we heard so much about? 
Well, that was another one of the experiments we were trying to do on the NASA IRTF. Very difficult experiment. You're trying to pick up changes of fractions of a degree, maybe a degree if you get a very big impact. But this is a simulation done by Joe Harrington of MIT showing the sort of ripple effect that was being looked for. But I think it'll take a while. It's a subtle effect. It'll take a while before they manage to get any of that sort of information out of the data, at least as, as far as that particular experiment is concerned. And now the Jupiter's quieting down. What about the aurora there? Well, the aurora on Jupiter are very powerful, thousands of times more powerful than our own aurora here on Earth, our own northern and southern lights. And what we normally see is that you get an aurora in the south, as you can see in this image taken a few days before impact, and one in the north. And they're more or less the same brightness in this one. The, the southern one is slightly, slightly brighter. But if we then look at what happened after the impact, now look at this picture. You can see the three spots where the fragments have hit. But the southern aurora has been really quietened down compared with the north. And that may be because dust and other condensates are soaking up the electrons that normally cause the aurora. So this is something that we're going to monitor over time and see how the whole situation re-establishes itself. A few more pictures I think you'd like to see. This one comes from La Palma, taken with the William Herschel telescope. The great red spot over there to the left and a whole string of impact scars. And this one comes from Australia, from Siding Spring, the Australian National University Telescope, and this shows the fireball 12 minutes after the impact of Fragment G. And then two really magnificent pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. Here we have the results of impacts G and D. And this one shows the red spot and a whole stream of black spots where the bits of the comet are struck. And no one's ever seen anything like that before, and probably never will again. But what about amateur work? John, you were using an eight and a half inch telescope and a CCD to monitor the cloud changes on Jupiter. What luck have you had? Well, we weren't sure whether we'd see anything at all with small telescopes. As it happened, we did get some good results. You can see in this video sequence taken through a red filter, two of the impact sites there near the bottom of Jupiter's disk and the north and south equatorial belts also shown. And these spots were so obvious you could see them in a six-inch reflector and three-inch refractor. And they must be the darkest spots to have been seen on Jupiter since its observation began. They certainly are. And then, boss, what about amateur radio work? We've had some amateur radio observations. We've had these results from Taunton School radio telescope. Jupiter emits bursts of radio noise between 18 and 23 megahertz. And here, using our 20.4 megahertz radio interferometer, you can see there that there appear to be increased bursts of radio noise associated with the impacts of fragments Q2 and Q1. So far as the actual observations are concerned, the major observatories are now winding down. So what happens next is due at very large to amateurs. You can see these results with small telescopes, and it's up now to amateurs to monitor them and see what happens. This is a sketch I made from Hurstman, sir. You can see some of the impact scars there. And Paul Dirty was able to use the 12-inch refractor at Keele University to make that drawing. Again, the impact scars are very clear indeed. No one's ever going to forget the past week. It's been a once-in-a-lifetime experience. When I come back next month, I'm going to talk about Australian radio astronomy. And bear in mind, that's going to be not on a Sunday, but on a Thursday, September the 1st. And meanwhile, if you want to latest information, then of course you can always dial up our information line 0891 800 or dial CFAX page 615. And so, until Thursday, September the 1st, from all of us here, good night.